I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Today, you're going to learn whether I think that the Korea Rhea Talon lives up to the hype of, ooh, vertical arms, best racing frame ever, la-di-da. Yeah, you're going to find out about that. And I'm going to tell you about why I decided to change out a bunch of the parts on my build and what I replaced them with. We'll actually get a closer look at how I finally built out the frame, and We'll talk also about these ZMX Phoenix 30 motors that I've got on it. So a little bit of something for everybody here. Stay tuned. When I originally built this frame out, a lot of people seemed to object to some of the parts that I put on it. Uh, they objected to the fact that I didn't use a 4-in-1 ESC. So the ESCs were mounted on the arms, and people argued that ruined the aerodynamic advantage that the frame has. It's kind of the whole point of the frame. People also objected to the flight controller I put on there, although I'm not 100% sure why, except that maybe just people don't think that HDLRC is a good brand. I don't know. I was more than willing to give the HDLRC flight controller a fair shot. But I ended up rebuilding it. And no, not because of public opinion, because screw you guys, I'll build what I want and you can take it or leave it. But I did end up rebuilding it because when I originally went to go fly it, there was, there was some really weird like ticking in the motors. Like they, there was, it was kind of like gyro noise is how that, what that usually is. And as they went to throttle up, the copter kind of tried to fly away. It didn't throttle down when I went to throttle down and just something wasn't right. And I never did figure out what the problem was. Uh, I suspected it might be the ESCs. It turns out that I put uh, Beale Heli Wraith ESCs on there, but it, they had been sent to me by a vendor, and it turns out that they were pre-production samples. They weren't, and so I couldn't actually even, conf they were locked out of Beale Heli completely. I couldn't change anything, not even the motor direction. Never mind flash them to a new firmware to see if that fixed it. So I was like, well, that's clearly not right. And then uh, the flight controller, maybe there was a gyro noise issue. I just didn't know. I actually ended up sending that flight controller and those ESCs to somebody else, and they put them on a quad, and they worked fine. So maybe it was actually some combination of all of the above combined with these ZMX Phoenix motors, which have, they have a, a it's actually patented. They have some kind of, custom way of designing the magnets that's patented by ZMX and I don't know what it is but <laughs> it means that you get a lot more uh, magnet power for less weight it's, who knows but the bottom line was it don't fly right and you know rather than spend hours and hours trading out one thing or another I just said screw it let's just wipe the slate clean here is the build and for a really tight build like this, I kind of want to just let you guys get a look at how I put it together uh, because I know uh, there's a lot of decisions you make in a build like this that you, know, you might just, every one of them individually might seem uh, trivial, but they might be interesting to other people who might not have thought of them. So one of the things I've done is that I have put the antennas on the arms as i do on most of my builds i don't like having the antennas sticking up above because i find that they tend to get knocked off and broken even if you're doing something like with zip ties they, they the zip ties get broken having the antennas here on the arms like this certainly does hurt the range but especially for racing i've never really had it be an issue you don't go in that far when you're racing anyway i don't get fail safes i don't even get low rssi warnings so that's that's my preference for where to put them I do have a capacitor mounted here on the back, and it was a real struggle to find out where to put the capacitor on this build. Uh, you don't want to, I mean, there was just not that many super good places to mount it. I wanted to mount it in the front, but it would have smacked up against the camera, and I didn't want in an impact the camera to be bumping up against it. I ended up kind of sticking it behind these wires here and, and zip tying it to the wires to help keep it from being uh, pulled on and tugged. It's worked pretty well for me so far. You'll notice I've also reinforced the main battery lead up against the arm here. I always do this on all of my builds because if a battery goes flying in a crash, I don't want these being pulled on and pulling on the um, pulling on the pads on the PDB. So this is where the battery goes, and it's it's worked okay for me. Just stick the battery in, plug in down there. It does get in the way a little bit when you're sitting on the table, but hey, how often are you doing that? The actual build is pretty neat and clean thanks to the combination of the 4-in-1 ESC and the Matek F405. It is a three stack, so it's a three board stack, so I did need to use the taller version of the Korea Rhea's body 
um, so so be it. But uh, it fits in there pretty nice, and it's worked pretty well for me. I know you guys are going to ask about this antenna. This is a Pagoda antenna, as you can see, and it's a custom build by a guy locally. Um, so, no, you can't buy it, and uh, in fact, I'm not even sure you should use it. Uh, there's some question over whether the Pagoda design will work correctly with a very, very short cable. Uh, there's basically no cable. And I've actually sent a few of these to Alex Grieve, who volunteered, that's I'd be crazy, who volunteered to put them on his network analyzer and see what kind of, uh, you know, VSWR and other, other characteristics it has. Uh, so, you know, this is just what I happen to be using, you know, on the day I was flying, but, uh, you guys are going to be, hey, where'd you get that antenna? I, you can't have it, and I'm not even sure you want it. With that being said, let's get on to the review of the quad. And while I'm reviewing the quad, I'm going to put some flight footage up of me uh, with some racing. You know, uh, I'm not the fastest racer in the world, but I feel like I put in a decent showing. You can watch me fly some laps, and I'll talk about how the quad flies. And to address that, we'll go straight to the question of... Does this quad live up to the hype? Are the vertical arms just marketing BS or are they actually having some benefit? And I have to say that I think the quad does live up to the hype. The hype is real. The first time I flew this quad, it felt like it had more up tilt than it did. What I mean by that is it felt like it flew faster than it should for the amount of up tilt that it had. And that continues to be true. It, it feels almost lighter than it really is. This is not an ultra light build, but the way it handles and the way it accelerates, it feels lighter. And that seems consistent to me with the, the claim that the air resistance of the arms is making a big difference. It feels like it has more thrust than, than it ought to and it accelerates, etc. So I do think the hype is real regarding the reduced air resistance or something about the overall design. In terms of handling, I definitely feel a difference. And in fact, other pilots who were at this race day that I took the copter to said they could absolutely see a difference in the way the quad cornered as well. The quad tracks amazingly well in corners. There have been some people who have actually been installing kind of rudders on the bottom of their quads to help them track better in turns. It makes sense that like just like a boat's keel, like the keel on a boat, that it would it would track through turns better with something to help cut the air. Uh, and this quad definitely does. In fact, going from this quad to a, to a regular quad, the other one felt noticeably looser in the turns. However, it was a little bit, I'm not actually 100% sure I liked it better. It's like driving a drift car versus driving an F1 car. They'll both get you around the turn. No, one's just going to do it a little differently. Although the racers out there will point out that the F1 car is certainly going to be way, way faster. I did, it was really interesting that with the, with the Carreria Talon, it almost felt like you were faster around turns by applying more throttle. And here, the F1 car analogy might actually hold true because an F1 car, the faster you go, the more downforce you get from the wing. And therefore, actually counterintuitively, most cars, you go faster, you slide out, you have to slow down to go around turns. But on an F1 car, to get enough downforce, you have to go faster. And, and this one was kind of the same. If I just cut the throttle during a turn and expected it to drift to the side and finish the turn, to kind of slide through the turn, it didn't do that. I would cut the throttle and it would just stop and, and it would end up going inside on the turn instead of sliding out onto the line I wanted. But if I kept the throttle up, I could almost pull it through the turn and, and could it felt like I could carry more speed through turns than with a comparable other quad. Now, that does have a downside. Uh, m several people have reported to me that on very, very windy days, this quad gets just blown all over the place. It just can't stay online. The same thing that makes it track well when you're turning on, uh, uh, on still air makes it just get blown offline left and right uh, on when there's wind. So that's a trade-off that you'll have to think about. But at least one person told me a story of a major pilot who was flying this at a high-end competition, and it was a super windy day, and he did really badly because he was having a much harder time than the other pilots who were using regular quads. So, there are upsides and downsides. As far as durability goes, I have to give it to this quad. It I crashed the dickens out of it, as I do on every race day, and it just did not even blink. It did nothing. Not a bolt got loose, not a not a crack in the carbon. Uh, I know that Carrillo Rhea is very proud of the carbon that they sourced for this, and 
Granted, we weren't flying on concrete or asphalt. I mean, that'll probably break anything, but I've seen a lot of damage. We fly this, this course and we fly this location a lot. I kind of have an idea of what to expect from it. This quad did definitely better than average in terms of damage, in terms of holding up. It protected its gear very well. I especially want to call attention to the way the front end is designed. I often pick on quadcopter uh, frames for not protecting the camera enough. And at first glance, it may look to you like the camera is sticking out to the front, but Carreria is very smart. Carreria, if you think about the way the quad's actually flying, where it's tilted forward, this horn does a great job of helping to protect the camera against a direct impact in the attitude when you would normally create a direct impact. By the way, don't be put off by this. This is uh, the GoPro mount, uh, so this is this is an additional thing I've installed. It's not a part of the frame. It's just a, a GoPro mount, so leave, leave, never mind that. It protects the camera very well. They've really thought this through. While we're here, I definitely want to talk about these ZMX Finex 30 motors. These are some super interesting motors. Um, they're 2207s, and actually uh, ZMX calls them 2207.5 because the magnets actually overhang a little bit. They're a little bit taller, but the stator itself is 2207. It's seven millimeters tall. Uh, and they, they're super interesting. They, As I said earlier, they've got this proprietary actually patented way of designing the magnets that uh, that causes there to be basically act like the magnets are stronger or bigger than they are while still saving weight. This is a 31 gram motor, but it puts out thrust numbers. Uh, Quad McFly on Mini Quad Test Bench compared these very closely to the Cobra 2207s, which if you know about the Cobra 2207s, you know what a complement that is. But he said they produce similar thrust numbers but the Cobra is like a 36 gram motor. So you're saving five grams per motor, which is substantial, or 20 grams over the weight of your quad. Um, it, the only thing he said about them that he noticed was that they didn't seem quite as good at dissipating heat, which means especially in the last like 15% of the throttle, they started to lose a lot of efficiency and draw a lot more thrust, uh, draw, draw a lot more amps than something like the Cobra motor. However, when we're actually in flight, you're going to dissipate. A, you're going to have a lot more airflow and dissipate a lot more heat than if, if you're on the test bench. So I suspect that that difference is no, not going to be as big in, in real world as it was on his test bench. And I can say that originally I was a little bit hesitant about these motors. A big whopping 2207 with a mat, you know, weird, strong uh, magnet design. I was sure it was going to really kill my kill my quad, kill my batteries. But the, the actual amp drawn by them is pretty reasonable. And big punches, I was peaking around 120, 130 amps. But during normal flight, when I was actually racing, I was cruising at around 30 or 40 amps with, you know, throttle punches into the 60 or 70s. Very, very reasonable. Um, you know, if you were going to use them for, well... <laughs> If you were going to use them for drag racing, you'd, you'd have a completely different quad with a big whopping 1800 or 22, I don't know, big battery. But for normal racing, don't be afraid of these motors. They did really well. Uh, and in fact, compared to some of the the ultra big, you know, you, we got some motors out now that are like 2307, 2407, big ass motors drawing huge amounts of current. That some of them are almost unusable on real world setups. These ZMX motors are not like that. They're 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 big and powerful, but not terrifyingly so. And uh, it, at least as long as you're a little bit reasonable with the throttle, they seem. I mean, this is not an ultralight quad. They seem like they'll be pretty friendly to your batteries. In fact, if you were to put these motors, I I think they would pair really well with a very very light quad because then they're. Their biggest deficit, which is the loss of efficiency in the upper 15%, would really be mitigated, and I think they could perform really well. So I'm, I, I really enjoyed flying these motors. Found them to be reasonably durable, although I, again, haven't flown them on cement yet, but just the normal amount of crashing. You know, the bearings are all still pretty solid, smooth, no grumbly, and uh, you know, yeah. The fact that they're open bottoms, it wasn't really an issue. Although I will say, going back to the Talon that this particular design, although it does a great job of protecting the motors, also tended to cause dirt and gunk to get kind of jammed up in here. Now, granted, it was never a problem. It always just fell right out. Just stick the end of a prop or broken prop or something in there and knock it out, and it was fine. But it did mean they got a little bogged up. But, uh, you know, it did a good job protecting the motors, so I can't complain too much. And that's going to bring us to the end of this review of the Career Rhea Talon. And if I had to give it, you know, like a thumbs up or thumbs down, I would say a definite thumbs up. I like this frame, and the more I flew it, the more I got to like it. 
the main thing to dislike about it, if I had to say, was, is number one, it doesn't fly like you expect. It has these unusual flight characteristics that you're going to need to get a little bit used to. And then your instincts about how to corner, for example, are going to be a little bit wrong if you then transition back to another quad, but you'll probably get used to that. The other thing to dislike about it is, man, it is fiddly to put together. And I know it, with anything, if you practiced, you'd get good at it. But having to check out bolts and screws and change, if you had to change an arm, boy, it's going to be, it's going to be asking a lot to change an arm, uh, you know, so maybe by, by two or three. And if you're going to race her and then you rate, how often do races change arms anyway? A lot of guys are just building two or three of the same quad. And then if one wrecks, they just get the second one. I don't know. Uh, it's not an ultra, ultra light frame. Um, it's not heavy, but all this aluminum really adds up. And if you compare it to like the state of the art in racing frames today, like something like the floss seems like a direction that people are going. They're building these really super light frames, 250, 300 grams. And, you know, that it's not that. But when you add in everything, you know, like durability and so forth, it still is probably worth your attention. There you go, though. That's going to bring us to the end of this review. Thank you guys so much for watching. If there's anything uh, that I failed to address, anything you think I've overlooked, or if you just think I got something wrong, <laughs> leave it down in the comments. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.